Today we have this really cool infinitely nested integral problem where the nesting occurs as one of the limits of integration. So yeah, that is something new. We have the integral of 2x. Now 2x is a fairly simple function, so it shouldn't be that interesting, right? The thing is, it's the integral of 2x from 1 to the integral of 2x from 1 to the integral of 2x from 1 to and so on and so forth. Wow. And we're going to tackle this problem two different ways. One is the incorrect method that logically leads to a solution. And the other is the correct method that logically leads to a solution. And the first method is sort of intuitively sound, at first anyway. We're going to call the integral i, but that means we have the integral of 2x from 1 to this infinite stack integral, which is, well, the integral i. Meaning that we can write i as the integral from 1 to i of 2x dx. And this is pretty easy to solve, right? 2x on integration would give us x squared, with the limits being 1 and i. So we have i squared minus 1 equal to i, which implies that i squared minus i minus 1 equals 0. And we solve this quadratic equation in i using the good old quadratic formula. So we have 1 plus or minus 1 plus 4 divided by 2, giving us 1 plus or minus root 5 by 2. So i could be 1 plus root 5 by 2 or 1 minus root 5 by 2. First of these values is, of course, the golden ratio phi, and the other is 1 minus phi, or in this form, we might as well call it a sort of conjugate of the golden ratio, so we're going to call it phi bar. But wait a minute, that's not right. I mean, an integral is supposed to converge to something. It's supposed to converge to one real number, in this case. It can't converge to both phi and phi bar, right? That would be, well, ridiculous. So now for the correct method, or the more rigorous method anyway, where we're going to treat this problem as a sort of a sequence problem. So let's define the function i of t as the integral from 1 to t of 2x dx. Now, under this formulation, i of i of t, oh wait, terribly sorry about that, is the integral from 1 to the integral from 1 to t, 2x dx, oh wait, I forgot the integrand over here. Okay, so that means for the first integral, that's i of t, we have t squared minus 1, and for the second, we have the integral from 1 to t squared minus 1 of 2x dx. And now to define this in a sequence fashion, let's call a sub 1 of t this thing here. That's i of t, and a sub 2 of t, the composition of i with itself. And that means a sub n of t would be the composition of i with itself n times that I'm denoting here by i to the n of t. And that would be the integral from 1 to a sub n minus 1 of t 2x dx. And this, of course, would sort out to a sub n minus 1 of t squared minus 1. Okay, cool. But what exactly were we interested in? We were interested in that infinite stack case. So that means we're trying to analyze the limit of a sub n of t as n tends to infinity, which would be the limit of the composition of i with itself n times as n tends to infinity. That would be exactly what our infinite stack integral problem is. So we're now looking at the problem from a different perspective. It's no longer an integration problem, or purely an integration problem anyway. 
It's now the question of convergence of a sequence of functions where each function is defined in terms of compositions of an integral function with itself. And I find that extremely cool, but how on earth are we going to begin the analysis? That's another interesting question. Well, the sequence of functions could converge or diverge depending on values of the t-parameter. So as a starting point, let's make use of a couple of values we deciphered from our first approach, the intuitive yet incorrect one. Because, well, we don't want all that effort to go to waste, so might as well make some use of it. We'll try t equal to phi first. So a sub 1 of phi, which is i of phi, which is the integral from 1 to phi of 2x dx, and this is pretty easy to evaluate. We have x squared with the limits being 1 and phi, meaning that we have phi squared minus 1. Now, the equation the golden ratio is famous for is phi squared minus phi minus 1 equal to 0, implying that phi squared minus 1 is just phi. So that means i of phi, that is a sub 1 at phi, equals phi. And what about a sub 2 of phi? Terribly sorry about that. That equals i of i of phi, which is the integral from 1 to i of phi of 2x dx. But wait a second, i of phi is phi. So that means this would also sort out to phi. And obviously, a sub n of phi equals phi as well. So phi is a fixed point for our function. And we conclude that the limit as n tends to infinity of a sub n of phi, that is the limit of i to the n of phi, as n tends to infinity, equals phi. Okay, cool. But immediately we notice another fixed point that could work, that is t equal to negative phi, because that would give us negative phi squared minus 1, which is, let me just write this out, which is the same thing as phi squared minus 1, which is again phi. So we would get phi the fixed point again. Okay, we're off to a good start. Now what about the t equals phi bar value? Well, phi bar also satisfies the equation phi bar squared minus phi bar minus 1 equal to 0, which implies that phi bar squared minus 1 equals phi bar. So again, we get the same structure, and this is another fixed point, as would t equal to negative phi bar be, because again, we would have negative phi bar squared minus 1, which is just phi bar squared minus 1, which is again phi barred. Okay, cool. This is what we've discovered so far. The limit of the composition of the function i with itself n number of times as n tends to infinity exists, meaning that the sequence of functions converges for the fixed points of the function i of t, that is for phi and phi bar, as well as for other points that I'm going to call eventual fixed points because they eventually lead to the actual fixed points. For example, we saw for negative phi, we had to square it, giving us phi squared minus 1, which of course equals phi, and then we got phi over and over again for successive iterations, meaning that t equal to negative phi led to the fixed point phi, as did negative phi bar lead to phi bar. And it turns out that there is actually an infinite number of such points that lead to one fixed point or the other after a number of iterations. Let me give you an example to clear that up. Recall that a sub 1 of t, which is i of t, sorts out to t squared minus 1. And a sub 2 of t, which is i of i of t, sorts out to t squared minus 1 squared minus 1. So we can ask ourselves, is there a value of t for which t squared minus 1 equals phi? Because in this case, the next iteration would just give us phi squared minus 1, which is phi. As in, that value of t would lead to the fixed point phi. And it turns out that there's not one, but two values of t. 
plus or minus root one plus phi. So these are two values of t that lead to the fixed point phi, and that's pretty cool. So we know for convergence, t equals phi and phi bar work out pretty well, as well as any other point that leads to phi or phi bar after a number of iterations. But what about the question of divergence? Let's first consider the case of the absolute value of t being greater than phi. That means t is either greater than phi or less than negative phi. In this case, we clearly have a sequence of increasing positive real numbers, meaning that the limit of i to the n of t as n tends to infinity diverges to infinity. Okay, cool, but are there points within the interval between negative phi and phi for which the sequence will diverge? Well, yes, of course. For example, you could take t equal to zero. That would give us for the first iteration, that is a sub one of zero, which is i of zero, which is zero squared minus one, which gives negative one, and a sub two of zero, which is i of i of zero, and that equals negative one squared minus one, which is zero. And because we got a zero, the next iteration would give negative one, and the next would give zero, and so on and so forth. So we would just oscillate between zero and negative one, meaning again, the sequence diverges. And that was a pretty cool analysis. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you, see you next time.